Here we go. Great. Well, first of all, hi, everyone. Whether it's noon your time or you're still in the morning, we're so happy that you've joined us today for our Alcohol Responsibility Month webinar focused on mindful mixology. My name is Erin Hildreth, and I'm part of the Responsibility.org team. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this is being recorded today, as you just heard. It will be on the responsibility.org YouTube page later today. And then also today, we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar to your registered email. You're all on mute at this time. And if you have a question, you can enter it into the Q&A box, which is right next to the chat box. Or if you're more comfortable with the chat box, that's fine too. Um, but this will allow us to address your questions a little bit more easily. And it's meant to be a conversation, so your discussion points are certainly welcome. I'm just going to get us going. All right. For those of you new to our organization, the mission of responsibility.org is threefold. We work to eliminate underage drinking. We work to eliminate drunk driving and also work with others to eliminate all forms of impaired driving. And we work to empower adults of legal drinking age who choose to drink to do so responsibly. For more than 30 years, we, along with so many others, have made great progress on all three of these missions. We have not done it alone because we all have a seat at the table of responsibility. April is Alcohol Responsibility Month. So this is the perfect time to reflect on these missions the progress that we've made, and our own sets of values. Responsibility starts with conversations. Responsibility starts with mindfulness, and responsibility starts with each one of us. Responsibility.org is all about conversations that lead to a lifetime of responsible, balanced, mindful alcohol choices. And we're excited to have you with us today as we have what's sure to be a really great discussion. I'm going to pass the floor over to Responsibility.org's Executive Director, Leslie Kimball, and Derek Brown, author and expert of Low and No Alcohol Drinks. I'm sure that they can introduce themselves better than I can. Um, so to make your acquaintance and to get the conversation rolling, I'll pass it to you, Leslie. Thank you, Erin. Um, happy Alcohol Responsibility Month, everybody. Um, I'm thrilled to thank you so much for the introduction, Erin. I'm thrilled to welcome Derek Brown. Um, I'm just going to do a quick intro of him. Um, Derek is the author of two books, um, the first Sugar, sorry, Spirits, Sugar, Water, Bitters, How the Cocktail Conquered the World, and Mindful's most recent one, Mindful Mixology, a comprehensive guide to no and low alcohol cocktails. Um, Derek recently founded Positive Damage Inc. Um, and is now a certified wellness coach. Um, and many of you may know Derek. Um, he formerly owned the Columbia Room in Washington, D.C., um, and won numerous awards for that bar um, and as one of the most nation's best bars, cocktail bars. Um, and he was also recognized as one of the nation's best bartenders. So um, he's way more than that. Um, so I'm thrilled that he's here with us um, today to have this conversation. Thank you so much, Derek, for joining us. Um, and as Eric, I'm sorry, as Aaron mentioned, um, we did wanna ask the audience one question as we sort of get going. Um, so the question is, and if you guys are comfortable to respond in the chat, when is the last time that you reflected on your alcohol consumption? Um, was it last night? Was it, you know, a month ago? Was it during maybe dry January, during the holidays? Let us know if you're comfortable um, just to sort of understand the context. Um, and Derek, I will turn that question over to you. When was the last time you reflected on your alcohol consumption? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I suppose that I do it on a much more frequent basis than most because that's a big part of what I do is I think about mindful drinking um, and by extension, mindful mixology. So so I feel that I have a daily meditation on alcohol and and, um, you know, in many ways, my life has really been shaped by a lot of aspects of alcohol, both in terms of successes and challenges. And so I feel very much, you know, um, qualified to speak on the subject, but also connected to, um, you know, drinking and drinking culture and all the good and sometimes the bad that goes along with it. Fair. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing many folks adding it in. I'll just add that I just recently um, went on a spring break with my kids and my husband. And so I thought about it quite a bit in terms of 
um, the impression I want to make in front of my own children, and uh, we were driving around, so making sure not to drive um, after drinking. So, um, and then Derek, one of the things that when we met recently that I loved that you talked about was you talked a lot about mindful mixology. So I'm going to ask you about that, but I loved what you said about judgment and having a judgment-free approach. So if you're willing to tell us about um, why mindful mixology and then throw in that judgment um, mention, I'd appreciate that. Sure. I mean, why mindful mixology um, has a lot to do with why mindful drinking. Um, but I, I'd probably start with mindful mixology and tell you all a little bit about that. So if you, if you don't mind a little bit of a ramp up, I'll uh, share why I wrote this book, Mindful Mixology, and, and why I care about it. Um, I think the first thing is, I don't know if this has happened to any of you all out there, but when you go to sleep, your brain keeps working, right? Like we tend to think of ourselves as asleep as inactive, but we're actually mentally quite active. And so one thing that I did is I had reflected on this idea of a non-alcoholic cocktail, uh, right? I thought, okay, what are the pieces that make up a cocktail in the first place? We have this historic definition, right? With 1806, spirit, sugar, water, bitters. And what really makes a non-alcoholic or even low alcohol cocktail? And so I kind of instinctively knew as a bartender of many years, what makes a good no and low alcohol cocktail. But I really just, you know, hadn't, thought of it in terms of a theory, like really laying it out. So I decided that I was gonna put it in my head when I went to sleep and I asked myself a question when I went to bed, what is a non-alcoholic or low alcohol cocktail? And so this doesn't often happen, but I woke up with the answer actually. And I, I don't know about you, all of you, but I keep a pen and paper by my bed just for these things. Um, and I kind of just scribbled it down and I realized that a big part of it had to do with the sensory characteristics, right? Like spirit sugar water bitters does not describe a highball like a bourbon and Coke or gin and tonic. It doesn't describe a you know, daiquiri or a margarita. And those are all called cocktails. So we don't really use that historic definition anymore anyway. So what is the sensory characteristics? And so, you know, when I thought about that, I realized that there's kind of four that uh, I would link to. Uh, one being intensity of flavor, one being piquancy. Intensity of flavor really just means like when you drink a cocktail, you know you're drinking a cocktail, right? Like it's not accidental. Hopefully it's not accidental. It, the flavor comes right through. Think of that gin and tonic and the, the botanicals and the juniper and all of that. Um, there's the piquancy, that bite, you know, like certainly people recognize that when they have a whiskey or tequila and, you know, it kind of leaves this you know, peak it flavor in your mouth. Um, then the length of it was just, just the amount or volume that alcohol usually takes up 1.5 ounces in most cases. Um, and the texture of it, right? You know, alcohol is a magic molecule. It does all of these great things, including conveying flavor and piquancy and volume and texture. And so if you're going to reduce the amount of alcohol or you're going to have a no alcohol cocktail, then you certainly have to kind of make up for these. Uh, in some way. And so that was the premise of my book. And that's where the idea of mindful mixology came from, that these are kind of the theoretical ways that you would create this non-alcoholic, low alcohol cocktail. Um, and actually, it's the way you construct any al uh, cocktail, for that matter. Um, and so so that's how I came up with mindful mixology. Now, the thing is that it, it, the judgment part of it, which I think is really important, um, is that when I say mindful, most people think of mindfulness, right? And they imagine a yogi sitting somewhere on a mountain or, you know, maybe you do that every day. You know, Leslie, do you ever do a mindfulness practice? Just out of curiosity. I, try. <laughs> I yeah. should probably do it more, but yes. Yeah, I try to do at least 15 minutes a day. And sometimes I, I'm good and do it in both in the beginning and the evening. And it's a wonderful practice, but, but it really is kind of beside the point. You know, what mindfulness is, is the present awareness in the moment without judgment, right? It's just kind of letting the world and yourself exist. Um, as far as mindful mixology, it's a slightly different use of the term, right? But it does share two things in common. One is it is being aware, right? And I think that that's a big part of what responsibility.org 
talks about in general is the awareness, you know, being knowledgeable about alcohol and its, you know, standard drinks and so forth, which we'll get into. But, but also, I think without judgment, that is so important, you know, because when we think of ourselves in all these different scenarios, we're always judging ourselves and we're judging other people and it, it creates so much conflict. And, 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 and if we really just try to see things as they are and understand that sometimes it's really, you know, whatever point in our journey we are on in terms of alcohol or whatever, you know, it's really useful just to sit back and say, where are we? Not where should we be necessarily, although that's someplace you could get to, but where are we and, and, and you know, what, what do we do with that? And I think that that in itself is mindful drinking, right? So mindful drinking is in some ways more like mind the gap, right? If anyone's been to England and they know the chime on the, the um, underground, uh, that's the way, it, you know, they, they mind the gap, watch the gap in between the, the subway and the platform. But, but I think it's just also throwing on that judgment aspect of it or lack of judgment, really. Um, Self-judgment is important. Yeah. And then uh, would you also say that if, you know, let's say that we were going to go to a bar and have a drink. Um, if I didn't order a cocktail, I, I, it is so bothersome to me if somebody says, well, why aren't you drinking? You know, and there's the judgment that comes with that. And um, do you mind talking about that a little bit too? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great point. The, the thing is that when you don't order alcohol, it's one of the few things that you have to tell your entire life story in order to do, right? So you go up to the bar and you say, you know, I'm not drinking tonight. So can I get whatever? Maybe they have a really wonderful non-alcoholic cocktail list, or maybe they just have soda and, you know, lime, whatever it is. And they say, Ooh, why aren't you drinking? And then that's the, you have to go through aspects of your life story or just say, well, you know, I have a meeting tomorrow morning. Right. Um, but I, I think that's a little unfair. You know what I mean? Ultimately sharing your life story should be something you want to do in the right circumstance and not something you're prompted to do just because you've decided not to have a drink that evening. Right. Um, and we can maybe get to this later, but I, I was recently um, with someone up in New York and they were saying they're in the recovery space and they were saying that um, sometimes when uh, he or she uh, has a, has a cocktail it's a no cocktail, but they get in trouble for, you know, they're, they get slack about that, you know, because um, they think that their peers are like, well, why are you conforming, you know, right. and they just enjoy the, the cocktail, the no cocktail, no alcohol cocktail, but, um, but it is a sort of, it would be great if that was a judgment-free zone. Um, yeah, that's know. exactly right. And I think that like, there are many good reasons to drink uh, and not drink. Mm -hmm. um, but among the worst reasons to drink is because of peer pressure. Yeah. I mean, that's, you should do it for yourself, not everyone else. Um, that's right. and then talk to me about your, um, your why. Um, so, so why did you get into this? Um, and, and why did, what made you want to write the book, um, and, and start positive damage? Yeah. So I have been, um, bartending for a long time. Um, I started working in bars and restaurants when I was 16 years old. Um, and along with that came a lot of instruction or learning from the people around me on how to drink, right? Um, and we're talking about lifetime waitresses and grizzled old line cooks and people who are very wonderful, warm people most of the time, <laughs> but uh, also people who, who may have learned from, from other old grizzled line cooks and waitresses and, and, and how to drink. And unfortunately, it wasn't the best way to learn. And so I got myself in a bit of a pro uh, trouble in, in terms of drinking. I started to later on reflect on my relationship with alcohol um, and realize that I wasn't where I wanted to be. And I think that that's a long winding story. I won't go into all details of it, but I'll just say that um, it was a moment that I realized that I had to address aspects of my mental health. I had to address um, aspects of recovery for me and what that meant. I never identified as an alcoholic, but I did recognize that, you know, I had a problem with drinking. And so, um, so when that happened, I was a bit, you know, crestfallen because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I mean, I spent all this time thinking about alcohol and, and 
you know, the many delicious ways to to prepare it. And so that that made it hard to really like imagine a life without it. Um, so as I started to have conversations with my friends and family and, and people around me, and I realized that um, a lot of people respected that journey. They understood it. And um, they, you know, my partner, Maria, who, who's just been a wonderful support in this all, she said, you can still talk about cocktails, but in this case, you're talking about choice, right? You're talking about options. Um, there's nothing, I, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol, right? Um, but for some people, it's not the right choice. And for some people, it's not the right choice in that moment. And I think that that's where it comes from, that we need cho those choices. We need the opportunity to have no and low alcohol cocktails alongside our standard drinks so that we can make the best choices for ourselves. And that gets complicated, um, but it's certainly something that you can figure out. And for me, it was something I figured out. I presently don't drink alcohol, although I'm happy to taste it and try stuff. Um, it's not something I drink on a regular basis, but I do ho hold that open that I may someday drink again. Now, I want to make a really important distinction here. So everybody, please listen to this if you haven't listened to anything else. There's a really big difference between recovery and mindful drinking. And I am not an expert on recovery. So I'm not talking about recovery and, and you know, people who have alcohol use disorder and that sort of thing. I think that's a really important distinction because mindful drinking is about choices when, when a person doesn't feel that they've gone too far, when they feel that they are in a place where they can make sensible and reasonable choices about alcohol. Now, I often say that that means you don't need it, right? The best reason to drink in some ways is because you don't need it. Yeah, that's a very, very, very good point. Um, we did have a question. I can see the the, the chat. Um, just in terms of you were talking about mindful mixology and no and low cocktails. How do you feel about the term um, mocktail? I feel conflicted on it. I get it why people use it. It's a long standing term that people have used and it is immediately identifiable. So I get it. Like, But it also is kind of insulting, isn't it? You know, like when you hear the word mocktail, mock means to insult somebody. So um, I think that mocktails, I heard this really great take lately. I was at a conference and uh, uh, a gentleman suggested that there were different uses for the word mocktail and non-alcoholic cocktail. So a mocktail is a sugary, sweet, maybe childlike drink, you know what I mean? Whereas a non-alcoholic cocktail is might be without alcohol, but it's for adults, right? So my son, not prompted by me, loves to make these drinks that involve lots of sugar, right? Like grenadine and agave syrup and strawberries and, you know, tangerine juice and all this stuff. And he gets quite creative with it. And it's really interesting to watch because I'm like, does that mean that mixology is like, you know, some kind of gene that we awesome. can find at some point? Yeah. Um, I've, I swear I've never trained him in any, any way, except when he asks for help. And so he makes these drinks and he'll give them to me. And honestly, they are terrible. I mean, they're awful. Um, they are sweet, sugar laden, nothing I would drink as an adult. And I appreciate that he does it and it's fun. And I and sometimes I'll even throw in olive juice or something like that um, at a, in a weird place. But, but the drinks that I make that are non-alcoholic cocktails, I, I wouldn't really serve them to them to him. And honestly, I don't think he enjoys them, you know? So I think, you know, maybe, I'm not saying definitely, but maybe mocktails should be a, a, a word reserved for the Shirley Temple and drinks like that. And non-alcoholic cocktails should be used for adult sophisticated drinks with or without alcohol. Right. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, all right. And so would you mind going through... Um, can you talk to us about types of alcohol, alcoholic drinks? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the hard things about being mindful, right? Is that there's so many different types of alcoholic drinks and they're often mixed too, right? So you have, how do you figure out, you know, what you're drinking? You know, you can go to a bar and you can order a margarita and it can be 1.7 standard drinks in some cases, 
you know, or that bartender, like when I first started bartending, I should not admit this, but I, I would like treat, uh, you know, gin martinis that had like three or four ounces of alcohol in them. And that was really a lot. Um, so the, the standard drink in the United States, which is really important to distinguish because in other countries, they also have standard drinks at different amounts. So if you're traveling abroad, this doesn't apply. All of a sudden you have to relearn it. But in terms of the United States, standard drink is 14 grams of alcohol or about 14 grams of alcohol. And that translates to 1.5 ounces of 40% ABV or 80 proof distilled spirit. We're gonna talk about what ABV is, so don't worry if you don't know what that is. Um, five ounces of wine at 12% ABV and 12 ounces of beer at 5% ABV. All right, now ABV. <laughs> So I said, so, you know, I'm so deep in this world that I'll say that and a person will stare at me and, and politely they don't want to say ask the question because they're just listening. But they're like, what the heck does that mean? Alcohol by volume means the percentage of alcohol in any drink, any liquid. Right. So if you had uh, so so we said five percent uh, or you know, in, in terms of 12 ounce beer. So just imagine that that's, if you had a hundred cups, red cups, right? Full of liquid, five of them have alcohol and the rest have non-alcoholic ingredients. That's the way to think about it in terms of a macro look at it. But, but honestly, it just means in that particular beverage, 5% of it is alcohol. What, what is the operative word here though is volume. Because everyone, even if you don't know alcohol by volume, instinctively knows that there's a difference between drinking a pitcher of beer and one shot of tequila, right? That one has more alcohol, even if it has less alcohol by volume, because it has more volume. Now, just to clarify, volume means the amount of liquid in the entire drink. So that's basically the different types of drink, but but there's so many different styles of drinks too, right? You have fermented drinks like wine and beer, sake, if any of you are sake drinkers, you have uh, distilled spirits that are, um, you know, actually through a process of distillation. Sometimes those are mixed too, right? Like if you ever had sherry or vermouth, or, you know, some of these are fortified, right? So they have both fermented and uh, distilled. Um, and then you have mixed drinks, which is my specialty, right? You're mixing, uh, sometimes it's really easy, gin and tonic. Okay, I get that, you know, but um, what about an aviation? You know, anybody who knows the ABV of an uh, a aviation, go ahead and put it in the chat right now. I have a feeling we're gonna be waiting a while for that one. Um, because you, a couple of things, you have to know the recipe. You have to know what spirits are being used. You have to use, know what non-alcoholic ingredients are being used and you have to know what dilution is happening. So in my book, I don't know if I'll, I, I didn't mark this page because I wasn't sure I was going to use it or not, but in my book, I have, um, and this is not just a semi book, but I have a, um, a, an entire formula, you know, volume of strongest AVV ingredient times strongest ingredient ABV percentage plus volume of, I'm not, I'm going to stop there. You got to know a lot of math to do this. There's actually just calculators online that you can use which is, may, makes life a lot easier. So what I would suggest for people who are curious about that part, the mixed drinks, is to go online. Um, and does responsibility.org have a calculator or I don't know if they do or not. We do have a calculator. Standarddrinks.org also has one. It's easy to remember. Fantastic. Go look, your, look up your favorite drinks and keep in mind that the bartenders could sometimes change the recipe on you. So you might want to ask. And because bartenders sometimes can be sensitive types, you might want to ask in a friend of the day, like, what's your recipe? I'm curious. It's really good, right? Instead of saying how much alcohol you're putting in there, which is not something uh, that bartenders like to be accosted with. So I think that like approaching it in a friendly way, figuring out what the recipe is, going to a favorite bar, going to a bartender you know makes a certain drink, those all help to standardize it in the long run. Um, and in case I didn't mention the word proof, just means double the ABV, right? So if you've heard a uh, Merle Haggard song that says old 90 proof, um, he's talking about 45% alcohol of a certain um, 
Tennessee whiskey, which is now not 45% alcohol, but that's another story altogether. Um, so uh, with proof, it's also when you travel abroad, different. So if you go to England, proof means something different. But we'll deal with that on when we travel to England. Um, awesome. Thank you. That was that was very helpful. Um, I'm going to ask you about alcohol and um, what goes into blood alcohol concentration. But before I do, um, you how do how do most bartenders feel if you were to ask for just half of a pour? Like if you're getting a gin and tonic and you just say half of the gin, you're just cutting it, right? If you count that for low or almost a little low, how do you think most bartenders would take that? I think they love it. I think they love it. I, it most people are scared of bartenders judgment, right? right. We've already talked about it's judgment. The judgment. Because, yeah. You know, bartenders can be cool types, you know, sometimes not me, but sometimes they have tattoos and cool gear or whatever. And, and so it's a little bit intimidating. So when you go up to the bar, I think the best way to do it is to recognize they want you to be safe. The number one thing that a bartender can do well is to take care of people, right? So ironically, most people think what a bartender does is serve alcohol, right? And that is obviously part of it. But the most important thing they do is to take care of guests and make sure that they get what they need and that they leave safely. In fact, in, in many places, that's legally uh, something that they have to do too. Mm -hmm. So um, the bartender is not going to be judgmental or upset or even side-eyed if you ask for half of a shot in most cases. I can't obviously account for every bartender in the United States, but but most of the bartenders I know would be thrilled because they're like, great, that's I just want to make you happy. I just want to make you the drink that you want. Um, in some cases, if they have a specific recipe, they might not know how to change that recipe to make it delicious. So be open to the fact that they might say, well, can we switch it to something else, right? That is low alcohol that I already have a great recipe for. Um, in the case of like a highball or a gin and tonic or an old fashioned, there's something that another non-alcoholic beverage company came up with called halfsies, right? And they just said, it should be, just give me halfsies, like half that and half a non-alcoholic uh, distilled spirit, which exists or wonderful products, or, um, you know, mix it with something else. In some cases, I will make an old fashioned with Lapsang Souchong tea. Has anyone ever tried that? Please put it in the chat if you have. That's an awesome tea. It's smoky. It's got like these pine, smoked pine. So it, it blends really well with like a scotch or like a really rich uh, whiskey. And so you blend those two together and you have uh, half seats essentially, you know. So I think that that's a, a way that you can get the bartender to do it. Obviously, it depends on what kind of bartender to wear. Sometimes like in a dive bar, you're not going to have somebody who has lapsing or strong tea. Yeah, that's fair. That sounds very fancy, though. Um, <laughs> all right. And then back to the alcohol and BAC, um, just talked about, you know, food, water, the time it takes you to enjoy your drink, um, your gender. Can you talk a little bit about how those all interact together? Yeah, so essentially, if you think of ABV as the percentage of alcohol in the, you know, in the drink, the, the BAC is the percentage of alcohol in you, right? So it's the percentage of your blood that has alcohol in it, um, which can be, you know, uh, obviously indicative of intoxication, right? So that's one thing that's measured when people um, are, uh, you know, um, suspected of drunk driving, you know, so they'll measure the BAC or the blood alcohol content. Everybody knows the, the you know, the, the test that you take. What is it, uh, Leslie? It's like a, I know that you had one at the- Oh, the, it's a, um, an interlock or a, a blood, a breathalyzer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. a breathalyzer is essentially yeah. what it's called. So, so um, that'll tell you that. Um, and so you have to be careful. Now there's a lot of different factors that go into that, right? So these are factors that you can use to make sure that you have a safe evening too. They're not just factors that you can use to see, oh, am I too drunk to drive? You can actually just think about it in advance and say, if I have food, for instance, that's going to change my blood alcohol content. Um, if I drink water, I think more and more people I know, they'll say, I'm gonna trade a drink for a drink of water because I understand that, um, you know, water is a critical part of this. Um, the time frame, right? So there's a real difference between having three shots in a minute and having three drinks in three hours, right? You know, those, those are going to determine it. There's the sex assigned at birth. 
So that has to do with your weight and hormones and all of this stuff. But ultimately, it means that if you were uh, assigned a woman at birth, uh, then, you know, chances are you can't drink as much as a man. Of course, that that starts to change a little bit based on other circumstances, too. So it's really important to realize there's not one circumstance that's going to, you know, affect your blood alcohol content all of them do right and so this is another case where you're going to have to learn math or you can go to calculators online which i find much easier yes indeed we have one before you drink.org i'm sorry virtualbar.org um that is awesome. uh, great to to go to um and uh, you know from i love that folks should know to eat before they go out if they're planning to drink um and but the tool does really help you out um to learn so virtualbar.org is what it is um and then last last question for you and then there are some questions in the chat um can you just Derek, give us some guidance about mindful drinking strategies just things for people to reflect on and think about you know before they go out or even if they're drinking at home with friends yeah there's one really wonderful term that um, my friend, and you may know her well, well too, Brandy Rand from the IWSR yes. came up with called tempo drinking. And that relates directly to BAC, right? Or the blood mm -hmm. alcohol content. What she suggested is becoming more of a thing in terms of younger generations, but everybody can adopt, is to be in the moment and enjoy yourself and focus on the company and the surroundings and use alcohol or not alcohol in a way in over time, you know, and not think of it like I got to get it all in quick, you know, um, this is about enjoying and savoring a drink. This is about enjoying and savoring your relationships. This is about enjoying and savoring conversations. It's awesome that earlier when you all were talking about what responsibility is, you said responsibility is conversation. And that like stuck in my brain. I thought, yeah, it is because being responsible can also be not just about sharing the information, which is clearly what you meant, but also it can be about understanding that the conversation is why we're there, not necessarily to drink. You know, drinking is a path in some ways to enjoy yourself in a social situation, right? The social situation though is the most important aspect of it. So, so the conversation is part of it. Um, so I think tempo drinking is part of it. Um, something called alternation or just kind of switching back and forth saying, I'm gonna start with a non-alcoholic drink and then I'll move to a drink with alcohol or I'll start with a non-alcoholic drink and then I'll move to a drink with low alcohol. So you can control that um, a lot. Um, also setting specific goals, right? So that's what mindful drinking really is in many ways is, is meeting your goals in terms of the way you drink saying, I, you know, I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be safe. All of these goals have to correspond to the way that I drink. And so that means that I'm going to, you know, set goals. Maybe I'm going to have one drink tonight. That's, that's my goal. Um, uh, maybe I'll have two, whatever it is, you set it for yourself. It's never, I'm never going to be there with you all. I'm sorry. I don't bartend anymore. So I can't even watch over you in that way. So setting a goal. Um, and then also, you know, using no and low alcohol cocktails, which is part of the alternation and, and, and maybe enlisting the help of a friend. You know, if you, I think sometimes our goals are easier met when we know we're being watched, honestly. Mm -hmm. And so having a sober friend or a person who doesn't drink or isn't drinking for that night or is drinking like you for that night, because you don't want to choose the person who's going all in that night to watch you. Um, you, you all can kind of communicate throughout the evening. Is this where you want to be? Do you really want that accountability, buddy? Yes, yes. It's so good in so many things, you know, but, but definitely for drinking. And then let's go back to mindfulness. This is kind of all full circle is um, there's aspects of mindfulness, you know, being aware it, as you have the drink, savor that drink, be, you know, try to stop thinking about everything else in the world. Think about the enjoyment of the drink, the conversation, the moment, how you feel, all of that. I think that can really help. Yeah, a, a, all very good, uh, good advice. Um, and we appreciate that very much. Um, one of the things that we've often thought about is the term happy hour versus the term reception, right? Reception mm -hmm. is you're receiving people, you're enjoying each other's company, you're talking, there's conversation, whereas happy hour suggests overconsumption. So again, we're not judging these terms, but we are, I think, importantly, reflecting on these terms and the words that we use um, as we talk about alcohol um, these days. 
Um, one of the questions on here, Derek, um, is um, asking about low sugar, so sugar free sugar free cocktails, a thing. Um, just in terms of this person um, is a diabetic, but asking about um, just you know sometimes a lot of cocktails have a lot of sugar in them. Skinny margarita. Can you talk a little bit about the sugar substitute or no sugar? Absolutely, yeah. And and this question has just been coming up so much, so I'm prepared for you. I'm ready. Okay. For you. <laughs> like I, you know, and as I become more focused on wellness, it's been something. It's a concern of mine too. I I consume a lot less sugar than I used to. Um, and so here's my answer. Most cocktails do have a lot of sugar in them, even ones with alcohol, right? So people think the non-alcoholic mocktails are the sugary one. But, you know, if you're talking about old fashioned, you're talking about half an ounce of, uh, of sugar. If you're talking about daiquiri, in some cases, as much as an ounce of, uh, of simple syrup, which is water and sugar mixed, but there's a lot of sugar in it. So here's my suggestion. Um, one, there are no sugar cocktails. And one comes from Washington, D.C. and is the official drink of D.C. I don't know if you all know that, but there's an official drink in two cities in America. One is the Sazerac in New Orleans, which has a fair amount of, 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 amount of sugar in it. And the other one is the Ricky in Washington, D.C. And it has gin, soda water, and half of a lime squeezed and dropped into the drink. And it's a delicious, especially in warm weather. And right now I'm peering out my window and it looks nice today. I think it's gonna be in the eighties in Washington, DC. So it is officially Ricky season. So um, I would say that that is absolutely a great drink to start from, but uh, there are also sugar alternatives. Um, let's just be clear, honey, agave, grenadine are not sugar alternatives. They are just sugar of different guises, right? So when I say that, it means that they all have the same glycemic index. And if you're diabetic, you already know that, but I'm just explaining that for everybody else in, in the room. So um, an alternative would often be something like monk fruit sweetener. Um, uh, that's that's one, the erythritol. Um, and, and so there's also um, these alternative uh, artificial sweeteners. Those are kind of a mixed bag in the sense that artificial sweeteners just taste bad to some people. Um, there's just, we all have different kind of, um, you know, we taste differently. And so I think that that means for some people, some of those sucralose and so forth, they just taste disgusting to them. And other people, it's no problem, right? And in terms of erythritol, there is a recent study out that kind of makes things com complicated in the sense that, you know, people who have, it, it suggests this study, which I would point you to, I'm not an expert on it, but uh, it suggests that there are some potential problems for people who have heart disease in terms of um, blood clotting. Now for a normal population, that probably doesn't matter as much, but it does bring question marks up, which I encourage you to do your own research and talk to your doctor, talk to medical professionals about. But generally it's regarded as safe. And so I would say that um, erythritol and, and monk fruit sweetener, those can be um, useful in substitutes. I, I eat them and, and don't seem to have a problem with them at all. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. This looks like what looks to be the last question, unless some, better, some folks add some more, but um, in terms of minors drinking or ordering no alcohol cocktails at a restaurant, um, this person has an 18 year, 18 year old son, and they're just not sure if that's an, if that's appropriate or not. It's funny, you and I talked about this as well. So what is your take? I know you have a, a son as well. What What is your take on that? Well, let me just say, so I, I recent, I've been consulting on a project lit recently where they we had this question. And they said, can, can we serve these drinks to minors? And I said, well, the surest way to make that drink seem like a kiddie drink is to put it in the hands of kids, right? So it goes both ways, right? In some ways, you don't really want to train your kid, you know, when they're younger, like my son, I don't want to get him started on non-alcoholic bourbon right now, even though theoretically he could drink it. Um, because I feel like that sets a bad precedent for what he should be drinking. Right. Um, in terms of like going to a bar and if I order a drink that I see the kid next to me ordering, I might feel a little awkward ordering it now. Right. Because I'm like, well, is that for me or is that for kids? And so so I think my perspective generally is keep the non-alcoholic cocktails for adults. 18 is a very interesting line. And I'm going to say that that's a really good question 
that you can ask, talk, to, you know, you can put through your head and think about and maybe talk to your son about too, because one of the cool things is that could spur a conversation. All right, which could help you to describe what is alcohol, why it's good, how you know, why it's bad, all of the different aspects of it, which is an, an important discussion that every parent should have with their kids at some point. So, so I would say take the opportunity to talk to your kid, but that is definitely a gray area, one that I, I don't think I feel comfortable laying down a definitive line. But I would say generally kids probably shouldn't drink adult drinks and adults generally don't wanna drink kids drinks. Although I do love Coca-Cola I don't drink it because it's probably really bad for you, but um, every now and then a Coca-Cola slushy is a real treat. Yeah, I love a good Coca-Cola. I will admit that, love. Um, but yeah, with, I've recently been uh, to a restaurant and the the waiter um, offered my both of my children a um, non-alcoholic cocktail menu. Um, and it was just, it, it, it was interesting to have a conversation about the mixology of it, but the when you add in the alcohol conversation, that's where I said, you know, this I'm not interested in my kids tasting a no alcohol spirit and just not for me personally, it's just not appropriate. So, um, one other, but no judgment to others, of course. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, that's really yeah. great. Everybody should should put that that question through their mind and really think about the implications of what it might might mean. Yeah. Agreed. And the conversation is good. One other question. What was the other non-sugar sweetener that Derek mentioned other than monk fruit? I like say it really quickly because I always mess up the way it's said. Oh, no. so it's erythritol. You. Erythritol. erythritol. <laughs> Let me okay. look up the spelling real quick. <laughs> That's fair. And that'll be our last question. Um, so, so I'll start. It's spelled to- E-R-Y-T-H-R-I-T-O-L. And okay. just to be clear, um, that's also in monk fruit sweetener and so you know, like these are all kind of related to some degree. Great, thank you. Um, there, they typed it into the chat. I think that's Aaron. So thank you, Aaron, for doing that. Um, all right, well, Derek, this has been so awesome. You've been such a great guest. We really appreciate all your expertise um, and thank insights you. on all of this. Any last things that you wanna add? No, I just want to say thank you for hosting this. I mean, I think it's a really great conversation. I'm so excited that so many people are on the line for this. And I hope you all um, enjoyed uh, our conversation and got a lot out of it. And I just want to thank Responsibility.org and you, Leslie, and Aaron um, for all that you have done to you know, support responsibility uh, and to to put me on the air to talk about mindful drinking. Thank you. Yeah, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Um, And then just so for everyone on the line, we will send out an email um, after we get this up, um, the the recording up on YouTube. We'll send out an email with that as well um, and it'll live there. So um, thank you so much again, Derek. We are always such a big fan of you um, and I appreciate it. And you too, Erin, if there's anything else you want to add. We are all set. You guys did a great job. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day.